Well, good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. I want to begin by just taking a moment to thank my son, John Mark, who filled in for me for a couple weeks. Um, oh, I went through a little bit of a rotator cuff repair. I know some of you guys, men and women, have gone through that, especially you athletes. I just fell on the farm, nothing very exciting, but uh, it's good to be back. And it's, again, it's as I've always said, it's great to have this privilege to, to listen how the Lord brings healing into someone's life, brings them to a deeper walk with Christ and his church. And sometimes um, through difficult struggles, our guest tonight, uh, it's great to have Michael Vanderberg on the program. He's a revert to the faith. He's the executive director of the Society of St. Vincent de Paul in Dayton. But he has a story to tell because his life does connect, connect with a lot of the struggles we've witnessed and heard about in the church, especially in the last 20 years. So, Michael, it's great to have you on the program. Great to be here, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Here, you told me over lunch that you live within the shadow of a Catholic university in Dayton, Ohio, right? I do. I do. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know a whole lot about the school, but I do know that their graduate program is very focused on Our Lady, right? Indeed. A good part of it is. That's right. All right. Well, let me... Let me back away and uh, and let's hear your story. Start from the way, very beginning of your spiritual journey, if you would. Well, I'm a cradle Catholic, uh, youngest of nine children. Uh, my mother is a Hungarian immigrant, and huh. my father was the uh, son and grandson of Protestant missionaries in Shanghai, China. He was born in Shanghai in wow. 1927, uh, before wow. all the uh, troubles came, in, you know, mid-century. So. Um, uh, we we ended up as a family settling in Dayton um, after being many different places over nine children, including uh, Iran. My brother was born in Iran, um, and so um, I'm, I'm a Dayton native. I've moved away for a few years as an adult, came back about 18 years ago, and uh, worked for the church in one way or another for quite a while now. Now, uh, clarify. Your your father was the uh, the offspring of the missionary. He wasn't a missionary, right? Correct. Yeah. So right. his, his mother was a missionary, and his uh, grandfather on his father's side was. But his his dad was the uh, preacher's son who wasn't okay. the missionary. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, they lived in China for the first oh. ten years of his life. Okay. Yeah. And so my mother immigrated from Hungary. So they're both immigrants of sorts, but um, American too, right? So. Kind of an unusual way um, to uh, to bring that family together. And did they meld their faiths together in a way that helped you, or did it? Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, well, my my father was um, the son of a Methodist missionary, um, but he himself lost his father at a young age, and uh, by the time he was in college, he described himself as agnostic. Oh, and then wow. throughout his life, um, became more of an atheist and then more of a militant atheist mm. toward the end of his life. Uh, my mother was a cradle Catholic and uh, very much old world um, Hungarian um, aristocracy is the, where she came from, where um, religion was a duty and faith was a duty, uh, but, but also a tremendous wit witness. And that, that's certainly mm. the foundation of my own um, seeds of faith, uh, witnessing her um, um, cling to her faith throughout her life. We often mention on this program over the years, PKs, and I'm guessing some of the artists don't know what we're talking about when we say PKs or, or MKs, uh, you know, pastor's kids, missionary kids. Yeah. And uh, in, the, in the work, PKs and MKs are notorious, kind of like the Old Testament kings, right? You'd have a good king and then a bad king, or, or Samuel's sons who weren't following him in, in his, their father's foot. So there's always that battle. And as I had, my three boys were PKs, <clears throat> and I remember part of the problem is, we be, as adults, we're so involved with the ministry, we, we sometimes take our kids for granted. And we just assume they're going to pick it up along the way because we're focused on serving Christ out here. And there's the struggle there. Yeah, there's a beautiful letter that my grandmother wrote to my father that I um, found after he died. Um, 
where she's writing to him when he's in his 40s. And, and she says, um, I regret that I never really talked to you about God. Wow. And, uh, and that there is a God who loves you. And uh, so it was tremendous to see that. And, and the fact that even through his own journey of agnosticism and atheism, he kept that letter all the way until he died at 82. Wow. Yeah, yeah that's the thing you, you, you just ponder for so long. Why did he keep that letter, Lord? You know, that's a great sign. It's a glimmer of hope, too. It is. Um, you know, and it's a, it's, it was a wonderful blessing to be with him um, on his deathbed. And, you know, when you're, when you're accompanying an atheist, praying over them is not your first choice, um, you know, when you're trying to connect uh, to them. But, you know, I remember praying quietly uh, with him and, and finding that letter later on gave me a glimmer of hope that something may have sparked there at the end. So. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a neat part of our Catholic theology is that we believe that at some point the Lord reaches everybody, tries to at some point. And like, like in, the, in, in the critical point in the, in the book Brideshead Revisited, where the father at the very end, the very, very end, when someone says, no, you see him talking to him. No, at the very end, he asked for the priest. Well, it was certainly an important part of my faith life to witness that and to recognize that faith itself is a gift. And it's something that um, uh, in order to be received has to be recognized and, um, and it has to be uh, uh, tended to. And right. when you are around uh, folks that you love who um, don't show the outward signs of faith that you become accustomed to, it makes you treasure your own faith more. So you, you had a Hungarian Catholic mother and a father that didn't, wasn't interested, all right? So did you begin with baptism at least? Right, yep, that's right. Yeah, so we were all, um, all nine of us kids, um, we, were, we were baptized and um, there was, uh, well, nearly all of us were confirmed. I think I was the only one who wasn't confirmed. Um, unfortunately, my, my father uh, suffered greatly from alcoholism, mm -hmm. and that made a, a pretty difficult uh, family life from about the time I was uh, maybe five or six years old all the way on up into high school. Well, well. well a big part of your story is, is what happened to you when you were young. I, I'm leaving that to you to talk about. Uh, because you said you weren't confirmed, and I'm guessing that this was part of the reason. Well, um, you know, the as I mentioned, uh, my my personal family life as a child was much different than um, many of my older siblings experienced, um, and a lot of it was due to the the struggle that my my dad had with alcoholism. And um, I think like a lot of other um, young people in the church who are troubled, um, um, they get the attention of adults in the church who are also troubled, who are um, uh, not healthy in how they uh, go about managing their own lives. And they tend to uh, sometimes uh, victimize people that they come across, whether they're adults or teenagers or kids. So, um, so I, I was um, victimized by a, a priest um, right around the time I was 11, 12 years old. And, um, and that was certainly a, um, a, a gut-wrenching um, process that um, didn't immediately pull me away from the church, but certainly had me confused about where my place was in God's world. Um, so, and as I as I got older and uh, realized what an unhealthy situation that I was in, not just because of the priest. I mean, interestingly, he was only just sm a small part of the equation, which again is a very common thing yeah. with people who are victimized. Um, 
usually their their lives are not very stable in many other ways. Um, it took me quite some time to recognize the effect of all of that on me and uh, um, my first inklings of it were when my next older brother took his own life um, in, uh, in his early 20s that caused me to reflect on uh, the, that earlier period in our lives. And um, oh whoa. And then I, I was, um, gosh, I was much older by the time I had a full realization of what had happened and I reported uh, to the church. So that was, I was probably 31 by then. So you're talking 20 years that you kept this inward? Yes. That's right. You know, I've read accounts of this and it seems that one of the problems for young folk is here's what I've been I've taught is right or wrong and here's my religious leader doing the opposite and so there's the tension that well if he's doing it, it must be okay I mean was that part of the problem all those years is the the quandary of the of the of the conundrum there between what you were taught was right and wrong and then what your religious leader is, is there was certainly a, a good bit of that, but I would also say that by my mother's particular witness, um, she demonstrated to me that the church was not really its members, but it was its own sacred institution instituted by God. And um, that was a powerful lesson that I witnessed in how she handled all the tumult, you know. Um, she was under a lot of pressure to. She didn't know about what happened. To no, you. she didn't know that, but she was under a lot of pressure about how to deal with my dad, and you know, um, you know, should should you stay? Should you go? Should you, you know, what what should you do? And um, you know, she, through thick and thin, she she stuck right with um, being the best wife and mother that she could, and that was a tremendous witness. And um, there was even a period of time where, um, quite a long period of time actually, about 10 years, where um, my parents were separated and I went and I lived with my mom. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and every day she would still go look after him. So she had appropriate barriers set up, but um, she, she knew that, um, that her marriage was very, very important. And to be that uh, stable witness to how um, how you can navigate your life even through really awful circumstances. Um, and, and she herself, she had a model for that. I mean, she grew up in right. Europe during the war. I was going to say, so, she was old school. And yeah. She's continuing the old school foundation. Well, and she lived right on the front lines of, of the, oh. the, the Russian and... Oh. and uh, what a story she did. Uh, yeah, American uh, uh, and, and German uh, parts of, the, of World War II. So... She, she's someone who came out of um, that kind of strife where you had to navigate your way in, in, uh, in an era where things weren't going the way they were supposed to. Our guest is Michael Vanderberg. Maybe just back up a little bit here. You were baptized, all your kids went, your brothers and siblings all went through the hoops. Okay. Did you know God? During that time, did you know God during that time? Yeah, I, I, I have a distinct memory of um, being in a, in a state of despair when I was 15. And um, I liken it to when Mother Teresa would talk about spiritual dryness. You know, yeah. the, God, where are you? Yeah. Uh, when you? When you know that he's there, but you're not feeling him there. And I have to say that, um, and this goes back to the, the importance, I think, of recognizing the gift of faith. Um, one gift that I had all along, and I knew it, was that I had this gift of faith. However <laughs> it had been suppressed, however it had been um, just just squelched out, uh, it was still there. And there was never a time when I didn't recognize that it was still there. And I know that not everybody has that experience. So that was a tremendous gift that, that, I, that I had. Um, 
recently I've been in the Coming Home Network, I've been doing a, a deep in scripture program uh, focused on the book of James. And James is a controversial book in some folks' minds, but on the other hand, some think that James might have been the maybe even the first book of the New Testament written way back when, you know. And it's interesting that if it was the first book, what's interesting is that the first topic he deals with, the first topic after the opening, line two, is count it all joy when you meet various trials. And from the very, very beginning of the church, the question is how are you going to live your faith in the midst of trials and temptation and all that? And he says, know that your trials are to develop steadfastness. They're there for that. Well, and one of the themes that's developed in, in how I witness in particular, both to my personal history and, and my own musings on faith, um, one of the themes that's developed is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and now I, I work in a field where people are unwillingly vulnerable, they're homeless, yeah. they're uh, in particular need of material assistance and accompaniment, but also the idea of intentional vulnerability and how Christ witnessed to us vulnerability all the way from the manger up to pouring himself out on the cross. Um, and what a tremendous opportunity that is to experience God's love in a way that is so centered on authentic relationship. And when we, the more we build barriers, the more defensive we are, the more enclosed we are in our own uh, and our own egos, uh, the less of an opportunity we have to, to understand and to experience, uh, really, beyond understanding, experience um, God as love and how we express that to each other and how we're willing to be hurt, how we're willing to be, to embrace uh, suffering and to see um, the beauty of love um, expressed deeper and deeper as our suffering grows. That's, um, again, a, a, just a tremendous gift mm. that helps us, it's helped me certainly uh, grow in my faith. I can't tell how many times uh, I, I, I feel sick, I need to see the doctor, so I set up the appointment, and then by the time I get there, I'm fine. You know, and, and I wonder, it's that way too, if you're, you're feeling depressed in, in your faith, you, you, you're alone and you got the stuff and you want to talk about it. And so you finally set up, you're going to do it, but by the time you get there, it's awkward to talk about. It's hard to get out. It doesn't seem quite the same. And that's part of that spiritual battle. It often hits us the worst when we're alone, when we're very vulnerable. And who do we talk to? And I'm trying to imagine keeping in for 20 years what what you went through as a young man. Well, it's interesting how you how you put that because what I found in my own journey, it's hard for me to be alone. It's hard for me to be wow. quiet. It's hard for me to um, be on retreat. Um, hmm. And I, I certainly err on the side of expressing my faith and my spirituality um, through uh, corporal works of mercy <laughs> and having many others around. Um, the, the work that I do, I'm surrounded. I mean, my, my office is 100 feet from a shelter with 250 men, women, and children in it. Wow. Um, so that sort of busyness, I think, is um, is something that uh, keeps me focused on a living faith. Um, periods like Lent are more difficult for me to to benefit from uh, because the more I withdraw the more I feel disconnected from a living faith. And oh. so now, I, and I'm full, fully aware that everyone has his or her own way of expressing their faith and growing in their faith. But I find it interesting that mine in particular is that I have to stay active and I have to stay uh, engaged. Well, I, I shared with you before the program, reflecting on the, what little I remembered about your journey was this great quote. I would wish I had the book with me and the, and the author and the quote, but it comes from a book called The Philokalia, which is a Eastern Orthodox collection of the great spiritual writers of their tradition. And in one of those sections, it's an older monk talking to a younger monk 
about the issue of self-esteem. You know, everybody's caught up in self-esteem, better self-esteem. And the older monk says to the younger monk, how, how do you cure the sin of self-esteem? And the answer was, you get out of your cell and you serve. You get out of your cell and you serve. And that's what you've witnessed too, is the, you know, the, the healing aspect of going out and serving and being available. Um, but like I said, the 20 years of keeping that inside was tough. Did you, you, so you're saying that yet at the core of your being, you had the gift of faith that there's a God. but far away. Did that last during that whole period? Or? Yeah, I, I think that, um, that that's, that's a pretty good description, that, that God was there, he just wasn't close. And the notion of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ was not something that I had ever really been exposed to in, in, a, in a meaningful way. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't the old world faith that, that my mother had witnessed to me. Um, and, and, and incidentally, uh, since that time, uh, she and I have had some beautiful moments of uh, my witnessing to her uh, that I know has, has enriched her faith life, as she's told me. Um, and it's just been a, a, just been a wonderful um, growth experience for, for both of us. But um, yeah, so that there's this, um, there's this, certainly this distancing. So I, I would, rec I would call um, this time away as a reversion, um, at the end of it, a reversion experience right. uh, back to the church, because there was a time when um, the, the, um, the trappings of faith as I would see them uh, were not uh, efficacious. I didn't see them as something that were, or, uh, that were really helping me because I was in this sort of dryness period. Um, it, it was more, much more in the background. It was never completely gone. It, it just wasn't, I didn't recognize that it could be helpful. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in, until I finally uh, was able to express my uh, whole story, again, in my early 30s, then, then, then is when I was rebuilding, uh, really, what, what was coming, um, welling up in me uh, to, to really embrace my faith. And you know, it was hard in my marriage. I mean, I was. I was at what was point in there time. did you get married? To... Yeah, so I, I mean, I was married at 23, and uh, God willing, I'll have my 25th <laughs> anniversary this year. Um, so yeah, very, very, um, very trying, uh, very trying time. Uh, was the church involved there? Or was were you going to church during that period? Yeah, um, actually, I was, and and um, I, I would say that I greatly benefited from. Uh, becoming confirmed as an adult. Mm -hmm. um, that didn't happen for me, I think, until 1997. Um, so I, you know, I had full awareness of what I was getting in, into with that sacrament. And, and if I had uh, been able to do that as a teenager, it, it would have been mixed up with everything else. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm certain um, that it would, there would have, been, would have been something lost there. But, um, I think that that was probably a, a waypoint in my awakening that, um, that, that has kept me committed. And um, it's also the, the point when I recognized that the, the life of service that I had been trying to lead up to that point had been um, grounded in this, uh, the Corporal Works of Mercy. And, and that's when I began to, to seek out people in material need, um, and, and I learned how to authentically accompany people who um, didn't on the surface have anything to offer uh, to me or my career advancement or my home advancement. So that was a, that was a very formative experience for me. All right. Let's, let's take a, a break there, uh, Michael. Uh, I'd like to, when we come back, I'd like you to talk more about what was it that led to your reawakening of faith it, was, it, was it your confirmation? But even doing that, you still had to decide to do that. What was it? And then I think you had to deal with, you brought that out of, the, out of your memory at age 31. I'd like to hear about that and how that affected your journey. All right. So we'll come back to that after the break. All right. Let's come back in just a moment and we'll hear the rest of Michael's story. Well, 
Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grody, your host for this program. Our guest tonight is Michael Vanderberg. And before we jump back in I, to a story, I just want to remind you of the CH Network website, chnetwork.org. Uh, where if you go to the website, you'll hear a lot of conversion stories, your apologetic materials, connect with The Journey Home program as well as other programs. But uh, if you have any questions about especially Michael's journey, uh, you can pose them either to EWTN, of course, or you can send them to us at chnetwork.org. We'd love to help you, especially if you may have dealt with some of the issues that Michael had to deal with. So again, that's chnetwork.org. Let's pick up again, Michael. I, I was thinking about those 20 years. I just imagined me, and you said during that time you had a reversion of faith. But move us on then at this point, because your life did take a different turn uh, during that period. You said, you, and your your marriage itself had to be healed as a result. Yeah, I think um, certainly a a watershed moment was the uh, 2002 uh, Boston Revelations and uh, the Dallas Charter that came out of that that whole period. Um, I remember being um, uh, responding to uh, the Archdiocese of Cincinnati's um, request for anyone who knew anything about anyone who had been abused to uh, to report. And so I, I was moved at that point to, to make a report. Uh, I believe it was in um, 2003 by that by that time. And um, so I I uh, was blessed to be received by a wonderfully caring chancellor of the archdiocese. Um, and um, he met with me, let me tell my story, and um, he was just so gentle and affirming. It was, it was just, it, it really uh, did much to help me reground yeah. and reposition uh, those experiences in my life that I could build a deeper, richer faith life from. Mm. And um, as a as a consequence of that. Um, I was um, uh, also engaged with uh, the local chapter of the Survivors Network of those abused by priests, or yep. SNAP, um, and I learned quite a bit from monthly gatherings with those folks. Um, there's even one person I got to know who, shortly after I met him, ended up taking his own life. Uh, it was just a... Whoa. Uh, a terrible um, uh, awakening to the depth of um, the problem that each of us had experienced in a different way. Um, and so, one, but one of the other things that I learned was that um, unlike most of the folks that were in that group, I had held on to that gift of faith. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and that's when I realized what a treasure that it was. And that, um, you know, I, 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 I knew that I had, I had to build on it. I knew that I had to focus on it. Um, and that was the time that I intentionally sought out um, working in the church. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went from becoming a volunteer member of the Child Protection Review Board um, for about a year. I was I was doing that just as a volunteer to um, um, getting a position as a as the director of stewardship for the archdiocese. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember very distinctly in my interview for the position, since the abuse scandal was still so very raw, and as the stewardship director, I'd be responsible for raising funds for the institutional church. And so one of the questions was, well, how will you handle that when someone asks you about um, abuse in the church? And my answer was, well, as an abuse victim myself, I would share with them that, yeah, this is an important uh, piece for us to learn from and that the, the church is not the individual members, but it's an institution by Christ and, and that, um, that our failings can't stand in the way. So 
that's how I got on that uh, new path to learn from um, these awful experiences and still witness uh, faith to others and grow my own faith from there. Did the, the reason that you kept it in for so long, I mean, maybe she's just ask why. Was it, and I'm wondering, is, is it because uh, people wouldn't believe you? In other words, a priest wouldn't do this. I mean, it seemed like there was a period of that time where when people would try and come out, people would just say, no, come on. That was certainly a part of it. Uh, that was certainly a part of it. I, I mean, I'm, I'm no psychologist, but uh, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm certain that much of it was just papered over, just like any other hurt in life that you want to paper over and move on. Um, but certainly there's a stigma. Uh, and, and, of course, like nearly other like like nearly every other abusing priest um this one was very much loved uh by his people and um but actually i should say what really gave me the courage to come forward in that in particular was that i wasn't the first one uh okay. that that by the time i had come forward it had already been known um by several other reports that uh that he was uh, an abuser. In reading the stories, as we have, they, as they've come out, it seemed like there was a time, yeah, when most of that, you know, that, that can't be true. It can't be. These are priests, you know. And even in the Protestant world, you know, come on, these are these are men gave their life for Christ. You know, they're, they're, can't be true. Can't be true. And then as it becomes more and more real, the pendulum can swing almost to the other direction. Well, they're all this way. Mm. You know, and to the point where I'm not going to trust any of them, because down there behind it at all, behind that nice exterior is that. You know, how do you bring people back to to trust again? Yeah, you know, and I remember being part of that defensiveness. Um, you know, and um, I I joined the Knights of Columbus as a young man. I was uh, 21 at the time, and uh, we had a campaign going already by then to say, you know, support our priests, support our priests. Because some, you know, accusations had been made even by then, and and so there was this sort of defensiveness of the church generally that, no, this can't be, or or if it is, then it's just a few, you know, bad apples, and and we, we've really learned so much yeah. since then that not only is this about, um, uh, it's not it's not about homosexuality, it's not about. Uh, uh, necessarily just just uh, children, but it's about power structures and yeah. and healthy behaviors and um, psychosexual development and and you know just proper formation, proper support through formation. So even today, I spend uh, quite a bit of um, energy engaging with seminarians and prospective seminarians to talk through this from my own, from my perspective and to um, have them uh, share their perspectives on coming into it. A church that's a different church than it was when you and I were kids. Yeah, yeah. and um, I know that I shared this on on this program before, uh, but there's a a scripture text in the part of the Bible that our our separated brethren don't include in theirs, uh, but it's in the book of Sirach. And in fact, I read it recently with one of the one of the office of readings. One of the great spiritual writers quoted this text. In its second, it's Sirach 2, 1, it says, My son, if you come forward to serve the Lord, prepare yourself for temptation. So any priest that discerns to call to come forward, he's entering into the battle. And so in their seminary training, and that's what we're to help them get ready to fight the battles of temptation. And they're going to be tempted. So, like you said, it isn't just this one issue or just this one issue. There's lots of things. And was it uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen who said the, the devil stations more demons on monastery walls than in dens of iniquity because the latter offer no resistance? <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, did you... Let me see. So, talk a little bit more, if you would, on how the St. Vincent de Paul calling has been a healing 
for all of that, that, that work. Talk about the, the importance of that. Well, I think one of the important steps for me is to recognize that even in the depths of my own suffering, um, that I have brothers and sisters, strangers, enemies, who have experienced that and then some. And to be able to recognize that and to, to witness how um, accompanying them can be helpful to them and to me, as others have been helpful in accompanying me, um, that, that, that is what draws me to, to that work. And to the constant reminder that every one of us is broken and that we need a Redeemer and we have a Redeemer in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, that We have to be reminded of that. And um, working w in, with folks who are so vulnerable, again, not by their own choice, but um, by uh, their circumstances, um, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity for me to grow in faith. And furthermore, in the, I know when I'm entering an authentic relationship with them, when I'm sharing and they're sharing, and we are, we in that tension, we have relationship with each other. We're we're sharing with each other in the way that that Christ modeled for us. Um, so you know the the idea that we have wounds and that we're inviting each other to tenderly probe those wounds, and that in our confidence and faith mm -hmm. and in our um, tenderness toward each other, um, we can experience a love that, that you can't experience any other way. Could you talk about the poor? It almost seems in, in our new world, in our new America, with all the stuff we have in the soup of materialism that we live in, that that the poor are different than they were. And, it's, and I think that, to me, that's how the devil laughs. You know, do we see the poor? Are we able to do ex the, the one thing that Christ wanted us to do was to see him in the poor? Talk about you, because you work with the poor. So what strikes me most about um, working with the materially poor is the simplicity that they bring to their lives. And that simplicity is simultaneously uh, a major part of their circumstances, uh, it, what brought them to those circumstances, but also um, a, a wonderful reminder of what is really important uh, in, in life. And, you know, I, I tell all, the, uh, all of our employees and volunteers, when someone comes to you in vulnerability, there are three things you can do. Uh, one, you can ignore them. Two, you can take advantage of them. And three, you can will their good. You can love on them. Yeah. And um, it, it, it's, it's just a, a there, there are no trappings around uh, that material poverty. There's nothing, there's nothing in the way. And um, it, it provides a, a just a tremendous opportunity to to enter into this fraternal love that um, is so hard to come by this these days because we surround ourselves with technology and and entertainment and pleasure. Boy, once again, it, what you said reminded me of James and um, where he talks in the beginning of that book. He says. Um, he says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. So in the culture they were in, the rich exalted in their richness and what they had and getting more because that, they were isolated from the trials because they had all the stuff. The poor, what was the only solution to the poor is to get rich. Where in Christ, it's a whole different thing. You know, the poor is called to, to appreciate 
the gifts they have in their simplicity to celebrate that, if you will, the humility. They've got the humility that the, the rich man is supposed to appreciate too. It isn't just getting rid of stuff or getting more stuff. It's about being totally open to what Christ can do in your life, where you are. And, and of course, uh, recognizing that you have been given it so that you can share with others. Well, there, there's an, a number of people who are in shelter um, who are severely mentally ill. And in their case, it's maybe a bit more difficult to establish a rapport, um, to, to see that thread of relationship connection. But over time, you find a way. God finds a way, oh. and you connect with them. And uh, what, they're an enhanced gift to me in that um, I've become part of their family unit um, in ways that they can't even express, and their their, their illness yeah. uh, prohibits them from doing that. But but grace finds a way uh, when when we're willing to to enter that uh, in faith. Our gift is uh, Michael Vanderberg. We've got an email, Michael Sandra from Minneapolis. What things would Michael suggest to someone who has suffered abuse in the Catholic Church? What means of healing and forgiveness were most helpful to him in his own journey? Wow, that's a wonderful question. Um, I can only, uh, I, I'm a witness and not an expert, I should say, first. But um, I think that um, your willingness to, um, to witness and to be vulnerable um, in, a, um, in an environment that is safe for you, feels safe for you to, to do that, I think it's an, imp it's an important thing to be able to talk about and articulate um, the hurts that you've had, whether that's in the church context or another context, um, I find I found it helpful uh, to focus on something attributed to Saint Catherine of Siena. Um, as our suffering grow, grows, our love grows with it. Our experience of, of love can grow with that suffering. I think that, as far as the institutional church is concerned, um, a healthy awareness that um, that the the trappings of the church do not itself uh, make the church, do not themselves make the church. As someone who's worked more than a decade as a lieutenant to several bishops and, you know, ha has seen how the sausage is made, so to speak, um, I think that was a very healthy part of my own experience mm -hmm. to, to see the humanness there, um, to see... Um, um, people who genuinely were, some weren't, but for the most part were, uh, trying to make the best decisions um, that they could. Um, I think that's a that's an important part of our human frailty to, to understand that, but not as an excuse, certainly, um, but as a, as a way to sort of become grounded in our shared humanity, and but also empowering ourselves as laity. Um, to be part of the church and not just be in it, but mm -hmm. to, to be active um, with our voice and our witness. And um, since the time that I took up that mantle to, to witness in a very public way, which I've been doing now for about 14 years, um, I, I've seen nothing but fruits come from that. And, uh, and, and I would encourage others uh, who've been hurt similarly to, to do the same. I'm, I'm thinking of an interesting parallel, though I'm hesitant to talk about this because I, I can't say I know how you feel if you, when you're going through this tragedy. But it reminds me of, you know, someone who's been abused, um, and then after it's over, how do they understand themselves? I'm thinking about, on the other hand, a woman who's been raped and then has a, becomes pregnant as a result of that. And, you know, we have a culture that would say, well, if, if you're raped and you, and you get pregnant, well, then of course abort that baby, you know. But, but there's a, in both cases, there's, isn't it a part of, of, of healing to realize that you aren't, you aren't the cause of what this was. You're still you. You're still loved by God. You're still the person in the midst of that. Or that, or that baby that's came in, into that. It wasn't his fault. 
he still has the gift of life. You know, or is there a par parallel with how do you understand yourself in the midst of of this tragedy? Yeah, again, I'm no expert, um, yep. but I what I cling to is that that gift of faith, that kernel of knowledge of of, of what um, what I recognize in my heart is the truth and what's important and what's real and um, what God wants for me and for others. Yeah. Um, th that, um, you know, th the other image that I have is, is the, uh, how something is forged in fire mm -hmm. and um, the poundings can come from all different yeah. places. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, the all the flaws um, come out from um, not just yourself, but from others in your life in your life who have intersected with your life. Yep. Um, but somehow there manages to be that beauty of life at the core that um, we either recognize as the highest priority or we don't. All right, got another email, Fran from Boston. Um, how would you suggest I respond to someone who says that the Catholic Church is not the true church on account of the things such as the bad things the church has done in history and recent scandals involving the hierarchy? Well, um, I guess it depends on what your expectations of the true church are. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it, in the end, we all rely on God. We, we have to rely on God. Um, we rely on Jesus to make up the difference. Um, we're, we're called to, to try toward perfection, but yet we know we can't get it without him. And so, um, I don't, I don't, um, I don't think too much about, um, the church is true church. I think the church is the church yeah. <laughs> and that, um, I, I would hope that each of us that calls ourselves a member of the church is searching for truth in that and, um, and that we're, um, we're, we're guided by our own decisions to um, not just uh, lift up what we think is uh, true ourselves, but in respect to the, the magisterium and, and everyone else before us, as best as we can discern, right? I mean, it, it's, um, there's all, you know, we, we've been shaken to our core, right, with the McCarrick scandal and yeah. And everything else, I mean, to the highest levels, um, what do we really know to be true? And, um, and, and the, only, the only answer that I can give to that is we have to cling to Jesus and we have to recognize that um, he is the arbiter and he's the one that um, set us on this course. And, um, you know, and I, I think it's also important to think about... Um, how faith is for, it, there's faith as understood by a child, there's faith as understood by Augustine, right, by Aquinas, and there's faith for everybody else in between, and uh, we're, we're all on that same faith journey. Uh, an image came to my mind, because I watch so many of these uh, construction programs on TV, I enjoy watching the main cabin builders and things like that, but you take an old cabin that looks like you just tear it down. It's a mess. But your job is to rebuild it like St. Francis. Well, how do you begin? Well, the first thing you got to do is you find that, that at least there's one board in there that's true. Because once you have that board, then everything else, you make it truer. And, uh, you know, the, the true church is the church Christ established in the midst of all this craziness. There's the blue line. This is true. And it can be surrounded by all kinds of other stuff, including, I know not you, but including me. <laughs> you know, well, I, I guess at, at least at least we don't have uh, current popes who are exhuming their predecessors and putting them on trial or anything yeah. like that right now. <laughs> I know one way to say, well, there's always been scandal in the church, so we can we can say that to, to seemingly diminish because, but it is true. You know, the time in the 14th century when the three popes at the same time, and you know which one, and they weren't even in Rome. So I mean, uh, crazy times. It doesn't diminish the reality of now, but it is the church. It's kind of like in the Old Testament when all of Israel is divided everywhere, but God is still holding true to Judah. 
because this is David's truth. He, he, no matter how bad the king get, he will not turn from Judah. Well, and you remind me that in my recent work at the St. Vincent de Paul Society, um, I've been doing more ecumenical work than I've ever done in the past. And, you know, after having worked for the institutional church for more than a decade, as I said, um, having the opportunity to work alongside my brothers and sisters um, who are, are focused on the corporal works of mercy and, you know, we, we don't get into theological discussions when we're out serving the poor. <laughs> we're, we're out there to serve. So I, I think that, that's, that's an important thing to remember. You're serving too. Christ. You're, you're serving Christ in that person. Rose from Madison, Wisconsin, sends an email. As a cradle Catholic, I don't know what to think of the church with all the scandals and corruption I hear about all the time now. Why do you think someone should remain Catholic with the terrible things that have happened in the church? Well, for me, it comes back to um, my desire for God and my... Um, my intent to uh, pursue him. And I have been so enriched by my engagement with the church that, um, you know, there's, for me, there's nowhere else to go uh, yeah. for that enrichment. A couple minutes left. I'm wondering, uh, did the sacraments themselves play a big part in your own renewal of faith, strengthening of your faith? Absolutely. Um, I think the, the sacrament of reconciliation comes to mind. Uh, and of course, the Eucharist, and as often as we have the privilege of celebrating it, yeah. although uh, lately, I, I have to admit, uh, the, all the, the recent public closures and limiting of masses and whatnot because of the COVID-19 scare, um, to me, that, that's actually, it's been enriching to remind me what a treasure um, the, the the sacrament of the Eucharist is, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's kind of an ironic time. What do we do when we when we're facing this uh, potential pandemic of of one disease course after another after another? We keep having them every couple of years, and it's interesting to remember that in the early church, the reason that Christianity eventually captured the hearts and minds of Rome is because when the plague hit. They didn't leave. The Christians were there with the plague victims to the end. And that is what impressed the Romans on the love and, and the commitment to them. We've got two minutes left, Michael. I'd love you to maybe make a final statement to anyone watching, especially Catholic families that are have got children and siblings that have left because of a variety of reasons. Any word of hope to them what they might do to help their siblings and friends come back to the church? Well, um, it's long been said that our deepest longing is for God. And I think that's programmed into us. I think that, um, as I shared with my own experience with my atheist father, I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't know what happened at the end there, and I pray for him all the time. Yeah. Um, I think that... Uh, I think it's important for us to remember that the way that we go about our own witness of knowing and loving and serving God um, does have a tremendous impact on everyone around us. And that sort of persistence is, is key in how we live out our own faith life and, and witness um, through those, uh, those daily actions and don't ever give up. Michael, I can't, uh, I'm just moved by a couple things that whether it was your baptismal graces, whether it was the the model of your mother, whether it was a word or teaching that she said to you, whether it was her prayers, whatever it was, that it all nurtured the seed of faith that for you was there through it all, that brought you here to this day. Yes. I mean, praise God. So if you say anything to our audience, the sacraments of baptism, prayer, witness, the little seeds of our faith that we trust that are still there in the lives of those people, no matter where they are out there. We pray that they can come back alive again, right? We need more Monicas. Yeah. <laughs> Michael, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank joining you. me on the journey home and sharing your journey, opening it up to the world. Thank you so much. 
And all of our prayers are with you and your continued work with uh, the St. Vincent de Paul Society. Thank you for giving your life to that work. It's, it's a great work. Thank You're you welcome. for doing it. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that Michael's story and witness is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week. Thank you.